All right. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, I'm Nitin Mathur from Tawaga. Uh, I, I assume that uh, uh, you guys are able to hear me. Uh, so if, if the answer is yes, please post in the comments chat and then I'll, I'll, I'll come to know about it. Yeah, that's great, uh, Arvind. Uh, thanks for confirming. Uh, Trade Smart team. So uh, once again, a uh, very warm welcome to the Tawaga and Trade Smart uh, webinar uh, this morning. And uh, thanks for taking time out on a Saturday morning. Uh, I'm Nitin Mathur from Tawaga, and uh, the idea for this webinar was, you know, just to talk about uh, the unsung heroes of this investing world, which is exchange traded funds, and some little known facts about exchange traded funds, about how we can create portfolios and how we can sort of, you know do asset allocation and some goal based planning around those uh, aspects as well through the uh, through the exchange traded funds model now before we start with that uh, i mean uh, one uh, thing you know which of course has popped up on the screen right now is that uh, tawaga and trade smart has partnered you know so we are providing the the advisory services and you know through our advisory services you can actually link your trade smart uh, account for execution so these are like you know some of the arrangements in place which are non commercial in nature and uh, idea for Tawaga and Trade Smart partnership is to actually more democratize the whole investment advisory landscape for people to you know come and know about exchange traded funds and you know create portfolios around that get an advisory handheld support around those services and uh, so on if there are any questions on the Tawaga and Trade Smart please keep going on uh, the comment section and uh, and I'll try to respond while speaking or one of my colleagues you know is, has also signed up so he will probably respond to your queries real time and then we can keep the interaction going um, so thanks again, you know, and uh, one disclaimer before we start, I mean, some of the topics that you're going to see in the coming presentation are, are not investment recommendations. They are more for knowledge uh, sharing perspective. And you have to trust your own investment advisor and your own analysis before making any uh, choices there. But, uh, you know, let me just uh, share my screen now and uh, that way we can just uh, jump start the conversation. Yeah, so I assume the screen is visible now uh, on this uh, whole channel uh, and uh, you guys can see the PowerPoint presentation that the screen that I'm sharing. Uh, what we are going to talk today is specifically about portfolio construction through exchange traded funds. Uh, now, this is uh, again a very important topic because uh, with exchange traded funds, you know, these are not like uh, just simple instruments that you can sort of, you know, invest in, but you can actually do much, much more beyond that. Uh, from multiple perspectives of portfolio theories, you know, which are there in the financial services world. But uh, the real problem, uh, I mean, if we just talk about that to start with, is that, you know, picking up the best financial instrument, you know, or the investing instrument is like really a moonshot uh, sort of a thing. It's, it's very ambitious and, you know, without even, you know, knowing the full potential of, you know, understanding the potential risks and so on of how does this play out and, uh, you know, what, what are the nuances involved. And that's where, you know, most people get it wrong because, you know, you try to punt on the best performing mutual fund or best performing mutual fund of 2021 or 2022. And then you are like uh, flooded with plethora of screens and then, you know, sort of confused that, OK, how do we go about, you know, sort of uh, picking up those instruments? Because there are so many and so many of them. So any idea about how many mutual fund schemes are there? Uh, please keep posting on the comment section and we'll come to know about that. But, but take a shot, you know, about what do you think are uh, the total number of mutual fund schemes uh, uh, which are there in the sort of, you know, uh, in, in India right now. Approximate ballpark numbers will do actually. Even I don't know, remember the exact number number of total schemes which are there right now, but a ballpark number should do. And that's, the, that's where the problem starts creating to a second degree is that, you know, you keep investing for uh, investment ideas on social media and you get flooded with sort of, you know, queries about, you know, various forums where, you don't even know who's commenting what and you're always confused that, OK, fine, you know, this is where, you know, this can be done through this. And, you know, there's some somebody will say that, OK, these are great stocks and you will take those tips and, you know, stock, start investing through tip based investing and so on. While one caveat here is the new age distribution, digital distribution uh, channels and so on, where, of course, you know, there are uh, various players, you know, who are regulated very tightly by SEBI, Securities and Exchange Board of India, uh, Tawaga being one of them, actually. Uh, and that's where, you know, some of those things are, are, are different than the sort of, you know, online uh, 
forums where you take all these punt based you know advisory and so on but the real objective is you know to how to pick up your best investment portfolio you know and uh, uh, i mean unless you are a day trader you know trading uh, like 24/7 in front of screens and everything what you want is really you know that uh, you, your time should not be spent investing tra tra tracking you know market movements while you know you better let make money work for you you know while you sort of focus on your core work or your core holidays and everything and you don't have to worry too much about how portfolio allocation plays out and everything so what we are going to do today is that you know we are going to understand a couple of case studies and through which we are just going to run through about uh, how things play out and you know what are the various mo moving parts around portfolio constructions and so on and one of the topics that uh, i want you guys to take home is uh, around rebalancing now in this use case you know what we are suggesting is that let's take a case study of a, a board panda or a lazy investor you know uh, who heard the theory of buy right and sit tight on on television and he was like fairly convinced about those theories and he said fine you know i i'm like uh, you know i i'm one of those investors where i will just do some portfolio allocation you know where where i'll split my wealth uh, equally you know uh, into nifty 50 etf uh, and then equally into gold etf uh, gold being very defensive in nature and nifty being very aggressive in nature you know that's the core philosophy while making the investment at the start date of january 2018 and when you do that the whole idea is that really you know you say that okay fine you know i, I just want to do or take risk in my 50% of the investment which is into gold while i am like open to taking risk you know which is into nifty 50 etfs and so on and you just uh, you know do sort of a simple allocation going into these two sort of you know uh, splits 50 50 so what does ha happen you know what does uh, what does the portfolio shapes up at the end let's say december 2020 which is today So what is interesting is that uh, gold has actually performed better in last three years than even Nifty 50 ETFs, and this is where the whole sort of you know uh, allocation get is getting biased more and more towards uh, better performing asset classes. Now there's nothing wrong or right in these these things. You know, it's just like that the original thought process of making this investment, you know, completely sort of deviating from that because now you're making 57% into gold and you know your whole aggressive sort of a portfolio. you know it's more like 53% allocations and so on so essentially you are actually deviating from your risk reward objectives you know that's the point uh, that i want to leave you guys with that really you know that's the whole problem statement which is there that uh, you are like biased away from your uh, sort of risk reward re objectives and so on and second part is that uh, despite like you know no rebalancing and you know allocating between gold which is like perceived safe havens you know you are actually not immune to drawdowns now drawdowns is something that we have defined as month to month returns and you know how much has the portfolio like gone into negative return and the specific use case that i'm want to flag is march 2020 because this is where we all got a root shock and root awakening you know some of you might be like in the first time in your career might have seen this sort of stock correction coming into picture and so on i've seen of course uh, multiple times in my career investing career because i was part of lehman brothers you know a uh, team when uh, the lehman bankruptcy happened and that was the same era where we saw like very sharp you know sort of drawdowns and everything you know in the portfolios because the market just literally tanked all the asset classes simultaneously sort of you know uh, went into deflation and then there were ob obviously no returns and uh, only negative returns in the in the portfolio and so on but march 22 is like a rude awakening for all of us that you know this is how bad things can get and this is how we need to be like really careful about you know how we uh, are planning about those things so the point is that despite uh, you know the the factor is that you did not do any rebalancing you did not do sort of anything touch you you perceived your portfolio as very safe saying that okay fine 57% to gold 43% into sort of you know equities or 50 15 to gold equities but despite that you are not immune to drawdowns in the portfolio that is the one important message that i want to pass on so what would have happened you know after this let's 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 take another step back and think about what would have happened if somebody was rebalancing regularly and what what i mean by rebalancing is that you are actually selling your better performing asset and you are like you know uh, buying again into the worst performing asset monthly rebalancing sort of a phenomena where you're saying okay fine you know i'll just sell uh, this this is better performing asset so that i i can move from you know 50 nifty 50, 50 perform better i will sell that and move it into gold if gold perform better i will sell gold and you know move into nifty 50 what what is interesting in this time horizon that we are uh, discussing which is last 3 years starting january 2018 to 2019 to 2020 i mean if you are not doing any rebalancing versus if you are doing rebalancing there is a 2% you know difference in returns uh, in the portfolio 
so that's where you know uh, different time frames will probably give you different re returns you know there's no nothing like one size rules all or something it could be vice versa as well that you know you you might get different sort of you know observations as well we did something similar you know in different time frames the difference was coming as 5% you know so those 2% 5% in your total portfolio returns actually matter you know at the end of the day because you are sort of allocating your monthly profiles you know you might have a big portfolio or a small portfolio but 2 5% you know uh, in a long term you know uh, compounding you know definitely matters to your thing but another interesting phenomena that we noticed here is that uh, despite rebalancing you know the, there was no guarantee that you know your portfolio is not immune to sort of drawdowns so in fact this is what we noticed that you know the drawdowns were actually higher it was like 10% uh, into into march 2020 you know which was 2% higher than you know your uh, no rebalancing sort of a scenario and this is the problem really that you know how do you look at uh, you know anything around that because uh, if you are chasing returns and when you are much much more closer to your financial goals this is when this strategy would have like massively backfired in terms of you know either you do rebalancing or you don't do rebalancing you are looking at 10% you know portfolio negative returns and you suddenly move away you know from your own career goals and so on think about that in a scenario where you are planning to pay for your tuition fees for your children or you know you're planning for holidays you know which is very close of to your financial goals and you're thinking about that and suddenly your 10% you know lower uh, in terms of your own uh, financial goals or in terms of your own uh, sort of you know uh, commitment perspective and so on and that's the point here that uh, balancing or without rebalancing the portfolio is not immune to drawdowns and this is where you sort of you know move very very much away from your financial goals so those those are the two key takeaways that i'd like to leave you know this first half of the uh, uh, presentation is that rebalancing actually ensures target asset allocation and this is where you know there are merits of doing it and there are sort of you know uh, still you know suggested that you rebalance your portfolio because you have to maintain a target asset allocation into your investments and so on and second important factor is that despite rebalancing portfolio isn't immune to drawdowns so this this is another you know key factor there that uh, you have to be mentally prepared for it if you are not thinking about your goal based planning and goal based planning you know this might impact your financial goals as well because if you are setting on a financial goal which is uh, hitting you in june 2020 or september 2020 then suddenly in march 2020 you are like scared like anything because uh, you are facing huge drawdowns in your portfolio and you are sort of you know concerned too much about uh, how these things will play out and you know how will uh, sort of you know you meet your own financial goals so the really the million dollar question is you know what is the right way to think about financial goals and overall portfolio allocation and this is where you know you have to think really hard that you know maybe rebalancing is not the full proof formula uh maybe not rebalancing is is, is not a full proof formula either then what what is the right way you know to think about financial goals and overall portfolio allocation through which you can sort of you know uh, do any investments or anything you know going into the future and this is where you know uh, the, the next slide you know come into picture is that uh, the concept that we want to introduce to you is something called the glide path investing approach now what we mean by glide path investing really is that uh, there are uh, uh, funds in the in the us which uh, originally you know envisaged this uh, sort of a concept uh, but uh, glide path investing is essentially a time varying asset allocation strategy and this is where you know this is like more tailored to suit financial goals of individual investors and so on now what vanguard has had, had envisaged in target date fund glide path was saying that okay any person if he or she is going to retire at a uh, age of 65 you know how how should the ideal portfolio allocation look like you know when they are moving towards you know their own retirement uh, so as you can see from the chart on the left is that you know it was more biased towards stocks international stocks and so on and then as you retire and after retirement you are much much biased more towards you know a uh, safe haven sort of investing which is you know uh, international bonds and uh, you know your own sort of uh, short term tips and so on you know which are uh, other instruments but uh, this is the whole thought process what we propose is one step ahead is that uh, why don't you integrate the target date fund philosophy into your sort of day to day financial goals perspective and what i mean by that is that in the right hand chart if you see think about every financial goal and this is an indicative sort of an allocation but think about it from that perspective that if you are 7 years away from the goal you have very high sort of you know uh, have very very high sort of a um, risk appetite you know for that financial goal and think about it like uh, buying a house 7 years from now 
or buying a house four years from now you know so you can take some risk you know uh, save uh, sort of you know money around that and you know take risk and you know uh, around equity exposure and so on your equity exposure can be really high on that perspective but if your financial goal is like one or two years away let's think about you know saying that okay fine you know my daughter is going to for education you know uh, university education in the us next year or couple of years back and so on then how does it look like you know how quickly can am i moving closer and closer towards the sort of you know that financial goal and this is where the portfolio allocation rebalancing is important while on the same part rebalancing and moving you know from something to glide path investing becomes much much more important so here you are thinking about various financial goals you are thinking about you know your retirement maybe as a goal you are thinking about you know buying a house as a goal you are also thinking about you know your own daughter's retirement as a goal and you are allocating different amount of you know equity exposures and you know creating portfolios around that and taking it from there what is there is interesting is that uh, you are sort of you know also uh, thinking about that okay there's no one size fits all you know because uh, you as an individual has certain risk taking appetite but on the same part your financial goals are defining your risk taking appetite for that uh, and this is the uh, example that i was giving that let's say if you want to buy a house you know you have to uh, accumulate money for that and you have to think okay how do i go about you know accumulating money for that if you are sort of you know planning for a retirement of course it's quite far and if it might be quite near as well but you know you have a different risk appetite you want to buy sort of laptops you know in order to pay for school bus uh, school fees or something you know and these are the times that you think about individual sort of you know portfolios and individual returns around that so let's say if you are if you are quite away from your financial goal which is like let's say retirement you have a lot of you know and if you are 30 plus some profile you know you have a lot of risk taking appetite you know towards that uh, financial goals and so on but on the same side if you are a 30 year plus individual you know qualified uh, in, in a professional job and you have to pay for school fees you know for your daughter or son you know next year or year after that your risk taking appetite is quite low you cannot assume that you know you can invest that money into sort of you know more and more towards you know sort of uh, equity exposure you have to move more towards uh, debt exposure or gold exposure you know towards that uh, so that your principal remains protected while you know you achieve whatever returns you know those asset classes return in next one or two years time but your whole mantra for investing changes uh, meaningfully and you focus very high on you know sort of uh, principal protection rather than going on uh, sort of you know really uh, uh, returns chasing and everything but your retirement goals of course i mean there's one important philosophy as well that if you are some 30 plus individual and you're thinking about your retirement and you're not taking enough risks then that itself is a problem so if your goal is retirement and you're quite away from that financial goal you have to necessarily assume risks as well because you know that will give you returns plus uh, you will be significantly better off when you are away from uh, when you are retired you know essentially if you park all your money into fixed deposits let's say you know this is the uh, area where you run very high risks of you know sort of uh, uh, very high risk you know in terms of taking uh, you know about uh, thinking about you know your own sort of uh, phenomena about you know how do you sort of uh, save for retirements your own returns you get into a negative real return inflation uh, scenario and so on so that's where it becomes very important to take risk as well now that's where one important factor comes into picture is that uh, what does etf do and why should you sort of diversify uh, through etfs as well now what you see here is essentially uh, something that we have done here uh, in in sort of our uh, studies is that if you use proper combination of exchange traded funds you can actually reduce your risk considerably what you are seeing here is a portfolio of uh, combination of six etfs and uh, through that combination of those six etfs what we have managed to achieve is risk uh, you know actually uh, reduced to more than half and while not necessarily compromising on returns so this is an important uh, point as well and uh, you know uh, of course what what the whole idea is that uh, you are benchmarking yourself with nifty sort of a risk and everything and this is where you think that okay fine you know is if i want to sort of uh, take don't want to take very high uh, equity risks as well but i want to like chase returns as well is it possible answer is through investments into exchange traded funds yes the answer is yes to that uh, and i mean please take a guess you know just just take a guess on your own sort of uh, uh, on the chat window let it come about you know what do you think is the mixture of red and green line you know this is there's a there are six etfs in there but uh, what are the these you know etfs i'm not asking for the allocation but what do you think these etfs are through which you know such such amount of brilliant diversification is possible possible as well 
where you can actually risk to reduce the risk many fold in your portfolio while not necessarily compromising on returns. I've not uh, mentioned the returns chart here, but uh, uh, returns have not been necessarily bad around those things as well. You know, so this is where, you know, sort of this whole philosophy about diversification and risk and other things are possible. And you can actually sort of, you know, take uh, a very, very good cues about, you know, how you can achieve it through exchange traded funds. Uh, it's not like that if you buy Nifty 50 ETF, yes, you will have a Nifty like uh, risk profile and so on. But if you diversify it through your Nifty ETF versus your debt ETF and, you know, your gold ETF and international ETF and so on, you know, that's where you got to reduce your risk significantly as well. So those are the things you know that I want to uh, sort of you know leave you with. Uh, what we are doing here is in terms of Tawaga. Uh, let me just play a small two minutes video on that, and that will give you an idea about you know what we do uh, and how do we integrate all these things in a robo advisory module and uh, how uh, how we benefit with a trade smart sort of partnership there. Hello, we are Tawaga, a Mumbai-based automated investment and advisory service that gives people access to cheaper more effective investment options and sophisticated investment techniques. The opportunity is huge. India is going mobile, but there is a lack of smart options for young investors beyond the usual mutual funds and banks. Poor financial literacy also breeds a lot of bad investment habits in people, often leading them to losses. Indians are thrifty savers, however. Indian mutual fund houses manage assets worth almost $300 billion, which is just a drop in the entire savings ocean. At Tawaga, we are creating a whole new way to invest and are empowering investors by planning investments around their goals and encouraging habits that shift user focus away from daily market fluctuations to goal tracking by giving them access to cheaper and more effective market instruments like ETFs and by helping them maximize returns with advanced investment techniques previously only available to professional investors. And all of this from an easy to use app. Here's how it works. We understand the user's risk profile through real world market simulation. We help them plan and set up their financial goals, build customized portfolios of ETFs around these goals, track their efforts and help them stay motivated to save and monitor portfolios for any rebalancing and loss harvesting opportunities. We are creating a whole So that's that's where we are, you know, so um, and uh, thanks for, you know, that that's the presentation part. Thanks for, you know, sort of uh, listening to me patiently. 